sorry. Zero. I need to update my photo too. My photo is like pre-baby. Yeah. My photo is pre-marriage. I love that picture. That's such a great picture. I'm like, I don't want to update that, it. That's a new, that's a relatively new one to me. That's fall. So I like oh, that's that. really, that that's really good. Yeah, I, I, although I'd rather than have a little bit more of the, the collar, I, I guess they really shrunk it. They, they really like zoomed in yeah, here. Really zoomed in. Yeah, she just like, wants to eat. Like, like, yeah. I need to take a photo. That's fine. Take photo of us. You're handsome. Take the photo. It's fine. I don't really care. Take a photo of us. Aren't we supposed to start now? No, 310. Right? I thought it was three. I thought it was three, too. Oh, well. I thought it was. Like, because I, I should probably get more caffeine. <laughs> I was just Maybe saying, not. If I, if I have any more, I'm going to be in trouble. I am already like shaking and moving. Uh, Hello, everyone. You know, I was telling um, McKay yeah, a while really ago. Like that, so. I said I have Okay, hang on. Yeah, I do. Hang on. Oh, um, okay, everyone, let's. Oh, my goodness. Can we all. Uh, I'll get white. We're a little bit like serious. Yeah, this one's so. Hello, hello, hello. Can everyone hear me? I'm walking around the room. Okay. Look at these nice little patient senate things. Isn't that nice? Patient senate. What's that? I see. I don't we see them? Can we see can't them? see them. What do they look like, Terry? Of course, I broke it. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea what that looks like. I don't, I don't even see it. Right. Not a clue. <laughs> good. It's very bright up here. Yeah. I have no freaking okay, clue what I'm going to say to you. I think I did it. I okay. I read the questions once. I'm like, oh. Okay. All right, everyone. This it's is my favorite part of the day because if you'll see up here, it's all advocates. And they're going to share with you. These are some of our, what I would call, they would, I would call them super advocates. <laughs> and um, they're going to share with you some of their best practices, their stories, how they got into advocacy. And many of you, this is your first time. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. This is the best panel of the day. And then McKay and I have a brief closeout, and you can have a little break before dinner. So, okay. So thank you, everyone. And without further ado, Demi, thank you. Hey, Demi. All right. Hi, everybody. Hey. I'm Demi Montgomery. Um, I'm a 23-year survivor of scleroderma. Um, so I have the pleasure of moderating for the patient <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so let me tell you what the Patient Senate is about. The Patient Senate is a united coalition bound by shared commitment to champion the rights of the patient community throughout advocacy and awareness. Our vision is to create a future where no patient journey is defined by unnecessary hardships or barriers. Who makes up the Patient Senate? The Patient Senate is made up of patients, caregivers, and advocates, all with a shared commitment to work at community, state and federal levels, to gain support for reforms, legislation aimed, and advancing patient access to and affordability of healthcare. Why join the Patient Senate? We want you to join the Patient Senate to provide you with a new, unique opportunity to actively contribute to the advancement of patient rights and well being. When you join the Patient Senate, you will be involved in collective advocacy, championing patient rights community, state, and federal impact, networking and support, and educational opportunities. So without further ado, I'd like each of the panel members to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about um, your state, what do you, uh, organization you represent, and your titles. I'm going first? Yes, you are okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Carol Harris. Uh, first and foremost, I'm the grandmother of an ultra, ultra, ultra rare, um, almost 10-year-old boy. Um, he is the only one of his kind. I'm also the co-founder and executive director of Avery's Hope. Avery's Hope, Avery is my grandson, um, Avery's Hope raises money and awareness for the rare pediatric GI community. And what we do is strictly patient assistance. We help with out-of-pocket and insurance denied expenses. We're out of New Hope, Pennsylvania, but we're a national organization. Um, and that's it for now, Michael. Okay. Michael. You sure that's it, Carol? I could, I could <laughs> probably come up with more if you'd like. Uh, so I'm Michael Riato. I'm from PA1. Uh, I live right outside of Philadelphia. And um, I am uh, just a few short weeks shy of hitting my 13th anniversary. I have an incurable blood cancer called multiple myeloma. Um, most myeloma patients don't make it past uh, five years, so I'm one of the really, really lucky ones, and I'm pleased to be here today. Um, part of the Patient Senate, part of advocacy, I advocate for 
a little bit myself, selfishly, because maybe I can get a law changed. It's going to make life better. But I think deep down, as all the time, I do it for those that, that, that can't, won't, or are just unable to. I think if we continue to share our stories, we can really make a difference. I advocate for several different organizations, Patients Rising just being one of them, um, International Myeloma Foundation, uh, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, Rare Disease, uh, PAN Foundation, you name it. I, I, it fills my life. And as Jim, where are you at, Jim? Jim and I were talking <laughs> out in the hallway a few minutes ago. And, um, you know, I've sort of found my calling after all these years of being diagnosed. And I think what I said to him is it, it fuels my soul. All right, it so fuels my soul. It gives me purpose in life. Uh, to be able be to help others. Throwing to you in a second. So, glad to be here. How do I follow that? <laughs> thanks, Hi, you're thanks a lot. <laughs> um, Hi again, guys. Dorothea Lance. I live in Miami, Florida. I am a native Miamian, native Floridian. Thank you very much. Um, my son, Hunter, uh, has prader willi syndrome, and he will be seven uh, next month. Um, he is the love of my life, and he is the reason that I have become an advocate. And I work as the Director of Community Engagement for PWSA USA, which is the prader willi Syndrome Association of the United States. Uh, we are embarking on our 50th year as, a, as an organization. We provide family support services, advocacy, school trainings, and you name it, we do it um, in an effort to help all families who have a loved one living with prader willi syndrome. Um, it has become the passion of my life, and May 1st made three years that I've been with the organization. Um, I joined the Patient Senate as soon as that opportunity came to be. Um, and have been with Patients Rising, I think, since its inception as well. So I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. yeah. So super cool. The, they're all super advocates, just to let you guys know. Um, so your personal journey and motivation. Wait, Frank. Frank. Wait, Frank. Oh, Frank. Hey, Frank. I forgot about hey, you. Frank. I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, Frank. Hi, everybody. I'm Frank Rivera. Um, I'm from New York, Long Island, New York, uh, born and raised. I have a rare disease called sarcoidosis. Um, I've been diagnosed for 13, going on 14 years now. And I started an organization called Sarcoidosis of Long Island, and that's um, 12 years, going on 13 years. And I also started another national organization called Stronger Than Sarcoidosis. And like everybody else that, on this panel, um, you know, we didn't expect to be here, uh, um, but we are. And the reason I came, it was really easy, is there was no, nothing around for me, or nobody around for me to um, get information for, for and from. Uh, so I decided that I'm gonna be that patient to help others. And so now, like everybody else, I have my own organizations, but I also work with Patient Rising. I work with um, a lot of rare disease organizations, and I also do help help with uh, mental health and chronic illnesses as well. Yeah, super cool, Thank Frank. You. Okay, I'm starting with you. So, okay, can you share a moment and experience that sparked your journey into your patient advocacy? Oh, okay. Uh, well. For me, the, I guess the moment for me was when I got misdiagnosed in 2004, and um, I was misdiagnosed with lung cancer. And that happens a lot for rare diseases, but unfortunately for me, it went a little bit further. I went through four years of chemo and radiation uh, for a disease that I didn't have. Um, so to fast forward to 2011, is when um, I had problems again, and um, they took a biopsy and said, oh, you never had cancer, you have sarcoidosis, and had no idea what it was. So for me, you know, like, like everybody else, went to Google and try to find, <laughs> find any information on it. And there is a national organization for sarcoidosis, and, but at the time, they only had three people working there, and none of them had sarcoidosis. Mm. I really couldn't get any information. So that was my aha moment that if I'm a patient and I can't get information, I, and I'm pretty well versed when it comes to computers, um, I can't imagine what the, anybody else is going through. Okay. Yeah. 
And Carol, same question. So I actually remember the exact moment. Uh, my grandson was diagnosed when he was three months old with something called microvillus inclusion disease. If you Google that, which you should, never should Google that, um, there are less than 100 people in the world. And he's actually under that umbrella diagnosis, but he's the only one of his kind. Um, in that he does, basically his disease is intestinal failure, and he actually can absorb some nutrition from food. But that's, we can talk about that later. But my aha moment was he was in the hospital the first year for 217 days straight. My son um, sold his business because mom had the insurance and he was going to be the parent staying in the hospital. And there were many times that I stayed with him and, and Avery was going to be discharged. So we go through the discharge, we're downstairs and first thing he, my son has to do is pay the parking fee. He's been in the hospital 217 oh days. My God. Right, and so usually it's $16 a day, they put it down to $5 a day, but if you do the math, well over $1,000. Then in his pocket is the prescriptions, very special prescriptions because he's so different from everybody else who has his disease. I stayed in the car with Avery, my son ran in, um, not one of the prescriptions were covered by insurance. And it was at that moment when I realized all he was doing was bringing his son home from the hospital, and it was $2,000 in debt already. And we hadn't even begun the journey. And it was that moment that I knew that it was really important to get a group of people together and form an organization that would help in the immediate needs, help with their out-of-pocket, their insurance-denied expenses, and just normal everyday expenses that are incurred when you're on the rare disease journey. Okay. Thank you. Same question, Demi? Yes, it is. All right. So <laughs> I, I don't know if I have an aha moment, um, but I got involved in advocacy way back in 2013. I was on an oral um, chemo drug that was uh, outrageously priced, and my copay share was through the roof. Uh, you know, it could, it could vary anywhere from 1000 to $1,200, $1,300 a month. It was kind of ridiculous. And sometimes you had to make a whole lot of choices with what you were going to do, you know, to stay alive or not. And an organization approached me and said, hey, would you come to our lawmakers and tell your story? And I said, sure. And that's how I got involved. Ever since then, I've been, been, been sharing my story and trying to help. I had an aha journey. Um, we got my son's diagnosis at 16 days old. and. I think to understand the advocacy aha moment or journey, kind of have to understand what this diagnosis is. So prader willi syndrome, the hallmark symptom of prader willi syndrome is something called hyperphagia, which is the inability to ever feel full. And the best way that it was explained to me and the way that I always explain it to other people is imagine not eating for three days. And now imagine feeling that way all day, every day, no matter how much or what you ate. And I say the what importantly because it could be things on the floor, it could be feces, it could be trash, you name it, it can go in the mouth and will go in the mouth in many instances because our population is literally starving to death all the time. So that this terrifying moment of this diagnosis, in addition to all of the other symptoms, the anxiousness, the excessive daytime sleepiness, the mood swings, the psychosis, all of these other things that go along with it, and I remember, I remember the first time I felt hope, and that was when I met with my son's specialist, uh, Dr. Jennifer Miller, who practices out of Shands in Gainesville, and she said, listen, don't, don't worry. I wanna tell you everything you read on Google is not what your son's life is gonna be, and there's so much promise on the horizon. And by the time he's five, there should be some treatments available. And my husband and I looked at each other and we're like, okay, okay, this is gonna be okay. Um, and we went home with that hope. And then we get through this first year and he's making strides and he's walking when they said he wouldn't be walking and he's running and doing all of these great things. Um, and then COVID hits and we start seeing these promising treatments get stopped. We see the, the trials going haywire, the data getting skewed and the FDA not even following their own directives. Um, and we start losing options 
and my son is three, and I'm thinking, holy, you know what? He's going to be five in two years, and there's nothing, and there's nothing that will be ready for him by, he, by the time he's five. And I remember I got a call from PWSA saying, hey, Dorothy, I know you used to, used to do some work in the Florida legislature way back in the Stone Age, and we're thinking about doing some advocacy work. Will you be interested? And I was like, I, I, yeah, I'm doing it. I'm, I want the job now. And that was my answer. And they said, well, we haven't even told you about it. I said, I don't care. I'm going to make the job. I'm going to create the job. I want it now. Three months later, there I was. I'll never forget that day because my, my husband is a teacher, and he came home from school. And I said, I did something today. And he was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to join PWSA USA. He's like, but you volunteer for them already. I said, no, 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 no. We're going to create an advocacy program. And he had no idea what that meant, but he knew it was trouble. Um, <laughs> And, and, that, and that was it, because the, it was that build up to that moment of, we cannot afford to wait for treatment, and nobody else is doing it. So somebody's got to be that person to step up. Cool. And I'll share a little bit about me. So how I got involved, um, I had actually had an amputation. Um, so with scleroderma tightens you, you lose uh, your blood flow. So. Um, it may be where I ended up getting a finger amputated, and my husband's like, well, you got to do something about this. Nobody knows about this disease. And I'm like, well, I'm going to go get a bill passed. And he's like, nobody's going to give you, you know, bill. And, I'm, you know, so it became like a challenge <laughs> with me and my husband because he didn't believe I could do it. And I just started. I called the governor's office, and then it just went from there. And then that's how I got the bill passed, guys. It was my husband. Um, but that takes me into... The next question, which is, what is your greatest triumph? Um, what happened in your advocacy, and how did it impact you as an advocate? What was like one of the biggest things that you had done in advocacy? So I actually, I think different from the other panelists here, I kind of look at it one patient at a time, one patient family at a time. And our organization is all volunteer. So, and we've been in existence for seven years. And in the past few years, we've started to get grants. And we got a travel and lodging grant. Um, it was a pilot program to use with Children's Hospital of Philadelphia's GI department to get families that live in the middle of nowhere with no access um, to CHOP for whether it be for clinical trial evaluation, second opinion, treatment, whatever it is. Well, we got this grant. Um, thank you, Rare Is. It used to be Horizon. It's now Amgen. And starting in the next um, few weeks, we are going to fund one family that lives in the middle of East Jabib, Pennsylvania, not near any trains, not near any buses. The family does not have a car. The child has short bowel syndrome. And there's now a new drug for that. It's an infusion, but you have to go to the hospital every month for it. This family couldn't get there, so they weren't going to bring their child. So my win, our organization's win, and the people involved in our organization is that this family is funded. They will be able to get the treatment for their son on a regular monthly basis. That's amazing. That's super cool. OK, Frank. What's your biggest triumph? OK, well, um, I'll, I put it into two ways. Um, because I don't like to talk about personal triumph, per se. Um, but I do have to say that personally and organization-wise, was we got a letter from um, Barack Obama for our um, work in the rare disease community. And that was something that was very unexpected, never uh, thought I would ever get that. So that was on a personal. But for me, it just also goes to the patient. When a patient, for me, the biggest thing is when a patient calls me, because something really quickly about my disease is that if you get it diagnosed early enough, 75% of the people go into remission. So um, when I get that call from a patient that said, thank you for getting me in touch with a doctor, um, I haven't had a flare up in so and so amount of time. That is something that's more important to me than anything else that I could do. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Michael. 
You know, I thought about this one for a while. <laughs> and I think the biggest achievement at the moment for me is just being here today, beating all the odds. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. my odds of being alive right now, they weren't really good. Yeah. And just being able to be here today, to be with everybody, tomorrow to be able to go to, the, I'm going to cry, to go on the hill, to be able to share my story, all the difference in the world. Yeah, you can hug me all you want, man. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody in the room will know that. <laughs> and Dorothea? Um, you know, I, I, think, I think the biggest triumph is, is yet to come. And I hope I'm sitting here next year looking out at this room saying, we got the drug approved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, the, the, the triumph is, it's not, a, it's not a personal triumph. When I started with PWSA and we had about a handful of advocates who could just get through the day and, and get a letter signed. Um, and we did our fly-in uh, about three and a half weeks ago and had almost 150 advocates from 31 states. We had 131 meetings with members of Congress. Um, 13 of those were member-specific in-person meetings. Mm -hmm. um, we have a congressional letter of support that is, as of today, being produced and sent out with a link that's going to be signed by over 20 members of Congress and sent to the FDA to support the work that our community is doing. I think my proudest moment is watching our community grow legs and spirit and come together and realize that, that they, their stories are powerful and that it, it's not about one person, it's about every single one of us and all of our collective stories. And just watching and being a part of a community that feels empowered. And, and I truly feel like with the work that we're doing in a year from now, we'll be able to say, I'll be able to look around the room at all of these parents who have become my best friends and say, you guys all did this. You guys all got this drug approved. And in 20 years, I want to go to a conference and I want to look around the room and see kids living with prader willi syndrome who have no idea what that is. That's great. That's, That's cool. wonderful. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move into something a little bit different. So navigating partisanship and diverse options. Okay, so today's in today's polarizing environment, how do you navigate working with politicians and other advocates who may have different views? What strategies have you found effective in finding common grounds and advancing your cause? Can I go first on this one? Yes, you can. <laughs> we love volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, Tony just stepped out of the room, but, but, but um, my friend there, we have totally different views sometimes, especially in politics. And um, we always remind ourselves, and we remind everybody else that we work with, that um, cancer, rare disease, it doesn't care if you're black, if you're white, if you're red, it doesn't care if you're, you're male or female, it doesn't care if you're, 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 you're gay or lesbian, it doesn't care if you're red or blue, it doesn't care if you're Democrat or Republican or Libertarian. It affects every single person the same. And that's the most important thing that you can get across. You know, I got a letter from, from someone yesterday working on some grassroots advocacy, and she says, I guess I should only send this to my Democratic senator, not my Republican senator, because I'm Democrat. And I sent it back, and I said, absolutely not. You need to share your story with everybody. Again, cancer, rare disease, it has no party. It has no color. It has no race. It has no sex. It infects every single one of us. And I remind every single advocate that that's the most important thing. And, and if they say, hey, but this and this person, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The bottom line is we're all humans, and that's what makes a difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and not only are we humans, but one in 10 people are affected by rare disease, whether you're the parent, the caregiver, the child, the niece, the nephew, the uncle, the, whatever it is. We all can think of one in 10, and I know this is true because I was speaking at a meeting 
and there were 40 people in the room, and I got up to give my little 30-second elevator speech, and I said, one in 10, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the meeting, out of 40 people, six people had come up to me to tell me their story. Mm -hmm. So healthcare really has, it, it's, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's not partisan, right? You know, healthcare is for everybody. And when you educate, you tell your story, when you remind them that they are also a part of this rare disease community, we've done our job. Yeah. We, and there's no reason to get all upset. You know, we may disagree, but in the, in the end, we're all affected by rare and chronic disease. That's it. Yeah. And one of the things I forgot to mention is what you just, one thing you just touched on a second. Listen. It's really important to listen to, to the other side, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, maybe you, you can pick up something. Maybe you can use that. You never know. We don't always have to use the same path as long as we get to the end mm -hmm. together. That's so true. Um, and, and I think that the more that, that I've been up here and the more that I've been with other folks sharing their stories, the more I see that. Um, in the eyes of the people that we're speaking to. And we don't have to agree on the way to get there as long as we can agree that we have to get there. Um, and when it's, when it's one out of 10, it's, it's, it's just not rare. Right. It's yeah. just not. Um, and, and I think that that is finally starting to penetrate people. It's, people are finally starting to, when I say people, I mean these people, Congress around here. <laughs> there, it's, it's, I can finally see that light switch being turned on when I talk to people. And, just by sharing the story, my, you know, I have, I have a, an 18-year-old niece who, uh, who was recently diagnosed with an ultra-rare disease. And she was going through a lot, and I said to my sister, I said, hey, you gotta bring her up for Rare Disease Week. She's gotta find her people, right? Because these are our people. And she came up here and was absolutely blown away, and she started sharing her story about how her symptoms started to arise after she had, was recovering from COVID. And we were in a member's office, and all of a sudden, that member's aide just perked up. So what did your symptoms look like? And all of a sudden, that, that aide was thinking about a member in his own family who was starting to show similar mm -hmm. symptoms after also having COVID. And that led us into a discussion about an NIH study that's going on for young adults who are starting to show symptoms of rare and ultra-rare diseases after having COVID, and what the link is and all of this. So it's just. We don't have to agree on how to get there as long as we can get there. Yeah. And Frank, you want to chime in on this one? Sure. Um, I agree, of course, with everybody's saying. I also, um, I do it a little bit different. I've always been a kind of a different person. Um, I really, the person that I'm talking to, it doesn't, doesn't, like you say, it doesn't matter if they're Republican, Democrat, whatever. I go into the, look at them and go into what they, you know, what, you know, find the commonality of, because everybody has commonalities. So that's the first thing. So I can, you know, talk to them that way. Then the other thing is I also find out about their constituents. And, you know, because that's, a lot of times that's what, um, you know, representatives think about is how does it affect my constituents? So, like for me, sarcoidosis happens to be one of the top diseases for all 9/11 first responders and survivors. So that, uh, I talk to him about that. Um, my representative, who no, is no longer my representative now, but him and I, we, we kid around. We used to kid around because um, we didn't agree on anything politically, <laughs> but it didn't matter because a) we were able to talk about things in a civil matter, and B, when, I, we, when we talked about his constituents, how many of his constituents de have to deal with this? Yes, one in 10 out of all the United States, you know, but when they, when they hear about, you know, something that hits their constituents at home, and they, he ended up do, setting up two congressional briefings for me. And like I said, we didn't agree on anything, but yet we were able to agree on this because it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't care. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, and now I'm going to switch over to the advice for the new advocates. So we have a lot of new advocates in the room. And what would your advice be for all the new advocates that are wanting to join the Senate? Can I go first on that one? Yep. So um, my husband calls these things Carolisms. 
Um, <laughs> so I use an expression, you don't know what you don't know till you find out that you don't know it. And um, I think with advocacy, I remember the first time I went to um, Rare Disease Week. So this is going back like seven years. I was like a deer in the headlights. I had no idea what was going on. They wanted me to talk about what? I don't know what? You know, I was so confused. And I think things like organizations like Patients Rising, taking a master's class, speaking to fellow advocates, getting a mentor mm. really is very helpful at, in the advocate journey because there's just so much. If you think about this morning's sessions and listening to all the bills that you know, are on the floor or hoping to be introduced, it can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so I know for me personally, having a mentor made all the difference. And then also, Patients Rising has a master class. Mm -hmm. That really helped tremendously. They broke it down. So many things were broken down into digestible pieces, which really has helped me a great deal. So I, I really think it's okay to say, I don't know, I don't understand, I need help. And you can still advocate and still look like a deer in the headlights, but we're all here to help you and to guide you in any way we possibly can. Yeah. Cool. Go ahead, George. Yeah. Can I go next? Yeah. You want to go next? Can I go next? Sure. Raise your hand if you're doing this for the first time. Wow. A lot Maybe of people, fun. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <Day one. laughs> Um, best piece of advice in the world, just be authentic. Yeah. Okay? That's it. That's it. Even if you can't remember what the asks are, that's why you have a team leader. Okay? That's why we're grouped the way that we are. You don't have to remember that. Be authentic about your story. 75% um, of the advocates we had at our last fly-in a few weeks ago had never done this before, and I had terrified individuals and and I had one say what if I don't remember anything and I said then just just tell your story and if you walk in and you're afraid and you're nervous then sit there and say you know what I'm sorry I just want to let you know that I've never done this before and I'm really nervous and 99.9% .9 of the time that person's gonna look right back at you and say please don't be nervous this you are you are a constituent this is why you're here and I'm here to listen and it's going to be okay Tell them that this is your first time here. Tell them your personal story. And if you have to lean on your team lead to bring it back home with the ass, then that's what your team lead is for. And just soak it up. Have fun. Enjoy the moment. Because by the end of the day, I don't care if you're a fast schedule or a slow schedule, you are going to be completely wiped. You're going to be like, baseball, give me beer, give me my hot dog, and <laughs> sit down and have a good time. You're going to be wiped out no matter what your day looks like. Just enjoy it. It, it will be the most energizing experience of your life, and you will not be able to explain it to anybody. And you'll say that when somebody asks you, how was it? I can't even begin to explain. I can't even, that, that is going to be your response. So just, just enjoy it and be authentic. Sorry. You're okay. I'm yeah. good. So a couple of things for, 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 for the new folks, the seasoned folks know. Meeting with your congressman or your senator is probably this slim, okay? And that's okay, because their staff is what really matters. Right, Terry? I mean, that health liaison, that staff leader. You know, don't say, oh, I'm only meeting with a staffer. Oh, no, hell no, you know? Uh, the staffer that I, I meet with my, my rep, oh, she knows my story inside <laughs> out, upside down, first name basis, we text each other, you know, all these years. And she'll absolutely take whatever I recommend or, or, or ask right to that congressman. So it's really important to not be upset with the simple fact that you're not going to see your congressman or senator. If you do, grab a picture for sure, okay, <laughs> all right, and, 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 and tell your story. But, but, I mean, meeting with the staffers, incredibly well. Um, the other thing I'm just going to go back, as Dorothea said, tell your story. No one knows your story better than you, hands down. And if you don't remember anything else, that you'll remember for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important thing you can do. And lastly, and you'll laugh, okay, they put their dresses and their pants on the same way you do. Yep. <laughs> okay? Remember that. They're the same. They're just people just like you and I. They're just in a different role. But your role is just as important as theirs. Okay, Frank. Hello. Um, I agree with everybody. You know, 
two things that I would say. Um, first off is if you don't know an answer to the question, tell them you don't know, but I will find out for you. Yeah. Um, it goes back to being authentic. Um, don't say something that you don't know, um, and because they'll hold you to it. Uh, the other thing is follow up. You need to follow up with your whoever you're meeting with. Um, I always kid around that um, Senator Schumer, who's my senator, um, one there was a three week period or two and a half week period. I actually stopped in. I don't I don't tell anybody to do this, by the way. Um, <laughs> I stopped into everybody's office, literally every senator's and every representative's office. And I didn't leave until I talked to somebody. They probably sent out a, oh. um, you know, somebody who had no idea what I was talking about. Yeah, <laughs> but I did. I stayed there. But when I got to Senator Schumann's office, who I, I have a really good relationship with, he actually came into the room and said, "Oh, I heard you were bothering all the other senators. They were calling you a pain in the neck." He's like, "They were calling you a pain in the neck," but they didn't say neck. I said, "Well, they know who I am now." Mm, good point. Okay, yeah. so. For me, guys, my advice is for you to scan that QR code on those, <laughs> on those photos and join the patient senate. And the, another thing is, um, when I started out with Patients Rising, I did not know those acronyms. I was dumbfounded. I'm like, what are you guys talking about? You guys are talking another language. So Jim, our almighty Jim, he made a dictionary. And if you guys do not know the acronyms, do not hesitate to ask Jim to send you a copy of the dictionary <laughs> so that you have it on hand with you next time you come next year once you join that patient senate. So, <laughs> so um, guys, okay, next we're going to talk about creating a lasting change. What do you believe is the most critical element in creating lasting change in healthcare systems? I'm starting with you. You're sitting right next to okay, me. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it's this. I think it's coming together, sharing our stories, recognizing that we're really all in the same place. We're all part of the same community. And by joining something like the Patient Senate and being involved with Patients Rising, our voice is elevated. Our voice becomes very robust. And I think... <sighs> as we go into our congressional leaders' offices, our Senate offices, as a collective voice, we can leave a very lasting impression that hopefully will change health policy, will move it in the direction that will help ourselves, our patient families, our patients, our communities. But I think it's things like this coming together that really will make a lasting change. And Frank, I'm going to ask you. I agree. Um, my big thing is collaborate. Even though we all have different diseases, we all have uh, basically the same goals. We all, A, we all want a cure. B, we all want fi financial help. We all want these bills that came out today to be, you know, passed, to, that it will help us out. Don't be afraid to ask for other organizations to collaborate with, because um, the more that you have, the more you will be heard. Yeah. Michael? Yeah. I, I think what we need to look at, too, is advocacy takes a long time. And you can't think that everything that we're going to present tomorrow is going to cross the finish line. So. Um, one of the huge successes, is, as McKay mentioned earlier, um, was the Quali Bill, which we advocated for for a long time. And yes, it was passed horribly, but it got passed. And yes, it's going to get through the Senate. And, and that's a huge achievement. One of the bigger ones, though, um, if you know or don't know, but, but the Medicare Part D cap and smooth that kicks in next year, and it caps it at two grand, advocated for that for almost five years. It takes time. Everyone thinks, I think, that, that we can go in and, and get this massive health care bill done and, and, ha and fix everything. And the answer there is, is that's not going to happen. You know, as I mentioned a little while ago, you can't boil the ocean, but you can't catch all the raindrops. So you, you literally have to take it piece at a time. 
And if we can get maybe the Orphan Drug Act passed this year, or maybe we can get PBM reform, or what, what did you call that? Predatory reform? Predatory. Predatory yeah. reform. I like that one better, to be yeah. honest with you. If we can get just one thing passed, that's a big step, because all those little parts add up to a big sum. And that's how I think about it. I think I'm going to piggyback off that. I mean, not to put another expression out there, but this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, and I remember what the reactions looked like the first time I came to the Hill and I was talking to people I had never met before about a disease that they had never heard of before. And I was trying to explain the desperation of our community. Um, and then I, I, I remember it was like the second or third, maybe it was the third time that I came where I started to feel like all of a sudden was finally being heard. And I remember there was a group of advocates. There's a group of us who keep coming on the regular. And now when I come, if Hunter's not with me, I walk in the office and it's, where's Hunter? We don't want you without him. I'm like, but that's because he doesn't speak yet. Um, so he, it's that, that consistency, that being present, and that just that mindset and knowing that you, you may just make that first impression tomorrow. It's when you come back that people are going to understand that they, these issues are real with more than just what they're hearing in the background. They need to hear from their constituents. These members need to hear from you once. They need to hear from you twice. They need to hear from you three times. You need to crawl under their skin and lay little eggs and pay them visits every like two, three weeks and be like, hey, remember me? I'm gonna be coming back. Or if you know somebody that's gonna be up here, reaching out to your members and saying, hey, I, I have a group of advocates that are gonna be up there. I can't make it this time but are you available for Zoom? So you're not asking them to not meet with a constituent, you're just saying, since I can't be there, can we have a virtual meeting? And then all of a sudden things start to click and it does take time. It takes time, so just remember that when you're here tomorrow. Okay, and I asked you right, Frank? I already asked you, right? Okay, <laughs> just making sure. And um, before we start the question and answers portion, I wanna talk about the task force. Um, McKay, I know I'm going to kind of put you on the spot. Can you say a few words about the task force so that everybody kind of understands what it is? It's a part of the Senate. And so we did give you a handout, Maggie, our lovely Maggie. She's not in the room right now, but she handed you a handout that tells you a little bit about the task force. Everybody don't kill me because I did it the font really small because I went on one sheet. <laughs> but it, it's there. So, McKay? Just when you thought you got rid of me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, task force. So as it relates to the Senate, what we've tried to do um, is, is kind of create two vehicles to get things done. One is what I like to call a bottom-up approach, and one is called a little bit more of a top-down approach. And so the task force, uh, and we have two right now, though we had, I, I, candidly, I had to take a little bit of a pause because this fly-in just takes up a lot of time and energy. But, um, but we have two right now, one that's focused on, um, at, at the state level, prescription drug affordability boards, um, and the second one's focused on um, discriminatory formulary practices. Um, and and the, the idea of a task force is it's, it's sort of driven by patients rising. It's a little bit of a collaboration between sort of our corporate members, our advisory board, which our advisory boards, for those that you don't know, is made up of some academics. Um, some um, uh, health policy experts. We have some folks with some very different experiences, really good group of people, um, as well as interested members of our patient senate. It's not mandatory to participate. Um, but the whole idea is, is not to you know, drag things out for like a year, year and a half. It's supposed to be very short term oriented. Let's you know, call that you know, six weeks to, I don't know, three months-ish. Um, and just try to get some tangible results. So, for example, on the Prescription Drug Affordability Board, um, you know, these are, some states are starting to implement these where um, I think everybody in this room sort of knows ICER. It's kind of like a state level ICER, but with actually a little bit more prop, prop, thorny problems than what ICER has. It basically empowers a bunch of academics and government bureaucrats to make decisions on medicines on your behalf. Um, thank you. Um, so one of the big issues with that is uh, what's an upper pricing limit and I said I, I listened in on the Maryland um, uh, prescription drug affordability board a few months ago and th this one guy I don't remember I don't remember his background but he was he was talking and it was like oh I'm, I'm feeling this guy I like what he's saying and then all of a sudden he's he and it was all about like you know 
lower cost for patients. And then um, he starts talking about the upper pricing limits. And it was very clear, very clear he had no idea what an upper pricing limit was. And uh, for those of you that, that don't know, it's um, technically, legally, it, it's not a price control the way that they sort of structure it. Uh, but it, it, in all reality, it is. Um, and so what, the ha what happens is it creates all sorts of access challenges through all sorts of fun utilization management tools and stuff like that that are detrimental to patients. I think I'm going on way too long. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Debbie. <laughs> How do you really feel? <laughs> um, but, but anyway, so, so basically we're, we're just trying to do some task force that are very focused, <laughs> short term, get some stuff done, get some points on the board, move on. Yeah. How did I do, Debbie? You did great. Right. So, we, so it's for everybody that doesn't speak McKay, we, it, it, it means that we identify um, an issue and then we go in full force and try to rectify that issue in a short period of time. And that's what McKay was saying. And <laughs> yeah. Wow. And so, and so everybody, we're opening up for questions. Um, I'm sure you guys got a lot of them. Jessica? Can you, oh. Okay, there we go. I didn't want it to be obnoxious. Um, so, Frank, you received a diagnosis of lung cancer, went through the treatments for it, and as a breast cancer survivor, like I was just like, oh, my God. Um, when you were going through that, what was the process like when your medical team started to backpedal, like, oh, you don't have cancer? And is this something that you see in your community that, a, a, um, that a lung cancer diagnosis comes first? And has anyone else had to go through the treatment before it's like, oh, oops, you didn't have lung cancer? <laughs> well, it was a little bit different because when I got misdiagnosed, I was living in Florida. Um, of course. So when I got re-diagnosed in New York, uh, so I didn't, ha I didn't deal with the same doctors. Uh, but my doctor that I did deal with that told me I had it, they, they really broke it down to me. They said, you have a choice. Like, everybody always says to me, why didn't you sue? Why didn't you sue? Blah, blah, blah. Well, my doctor really broke it down to me. He's like, first of all, the chemo helped uh, because, yes, it, a, lot of, a lot of patients with sarcoidosis do get diagnosed because it does, to the naked eye, looks like uh, cancer. Um, I'll, basically what it is, my white blood cells clump up together and form masses. So they look like cancer. Um, under the microscope, not at all. So, but um, he said, you have two choices. You can fight in, a court of, in the court of law or you can fight for your life. So, it, and he's like, I am not sticking up for these doctors. They yeah. did make a mistake. I am not, you know, not at all sticking up for that. But at that point, when I did get diagnosed, I already had it in 75% of my body. So I, was in, I wasn't in a good spot uh, physically. So he was like, you could either fight for the disease and fight the disease or you could fight the courts. Yeah. So that really changed my mind on, you know, what I, what I wanted to do. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. This uh, question for Mike, is it? Michael, please. Michael, pardon me. Yeah, Michael. one of those fastidious people, but anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> I was diagnosed with MGUS, mm -hmm. uh, but I know it'll uh, accelerate to multiple myeloma 1% a year, but I'm not sure when it started. It could have been, well, Last year, or 10 years ago, or 20, yeah. uh, do you have any advice? By the way, thank you very much for what you five have done. But uh, back to my question, uh, do you have any advice? Advice on what? If it's a uh, what I should do with my MGUS. Um, how about we have an off-camera uh, conversation after? Here we be, go. Be glad to do that for you. I'll bring the tissues. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no tissues needed. Okay, anybody else? 
Okay. And um, just so everybody knows, the handout does have all of these wonderful people's contact information on it. Great. Uh, except for Frank. Yes, it does. It does? <laughs> yes, it does, okay. except for Frank's. But if you want Frank's, I will make sure that you get Frank's also. Um, but everybody, we thank you guys for joining us for the first yeah. Patient Senate um, panel. Yeah. So thank you guys. Yeah. Did we do good with time? I don't know what time. Know, we did good. Yeah, I think so. Okay. You're right on time. <laughs> yeah, you we were right on time. We're so grateful for your attention <laughs> to this wonderful event today. I had things live streamed as We hope we you will join us again this time next year, <laughs> and we will talk to you soon. Good night.